The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for the podcast. And my husband, Steve Siegel, is co-founder and producer of the podcast. Today's episode is episode number 322. Just a reminder to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star rating so that when people search Google for podcasts about addiction that might give them some help, that our podcast comes up. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel by the same name, The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, and subscribe ring the bell so you get notified and give our videos a thumbs up. Thank you for doing that. So today's episode is an interview with a lady named Jen Zoe Hall. From a small town in Southeast Missouri, Jen Zoe has always been fascinated with horses. And at the age of 30, she started taking horseback riding lessons. And she also looked at the traditional way of training horses and realized it was kind of archaic using a lot of negative tools to control the horse. So she found a form of natural horsemanship. Now, outside of horses, her life kind of fell apart. Her ex-husband was going to prison for theft and fraud, which left her broke and homeless with horses. And she decided to attend a personal development seminar with Tony Robbins and turned her life around. She studies not just horses, but communication, human behavior, trust, relationships, and personal development. And she uses these to create life-changing experiences at her facility, which is called Zenner Gen. And we're going to talk to her more to find out about this. She now leads virtual and on-site programs using the Zenergen method of equine assisted empowerment to help transform lives through the spirit of horses. I love the concept. Let's talk to Jen Zoe Hall and find out more about it. Jen Zoe Hall. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. I already know that you have a story like none other, so I'm excited to talk to you. Likewise, very happy to be here. I'm honored to anything I can bring to your audience that will speak to their hearts and 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 help anyone that is going through a lot of a lot of tough times with with what's going on with addiction. So, so thank needed. You for Absolutely mm, yeah, needed. Yes. Yeah. Very so much. give us your background. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And what was your own history with drugs or alcohol? Tell us your story. Uh, well, I was really good at the clarinet in seventh grade. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I'm, okay. That's part of your story. I can take that. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> um, I, I actually am from a small town in, um, in Southeast Missouri called Poplar Bluff. And um, where our high school mascot was actually the mules, which, it, it, you know, that will make more sense as we get into that into the conversation, <laughs> you'll see. But um, yeah, I grew up in a small town um, and then I went to the University of Missouri and, you know, ended up getting my degree and getting married and doing all of these like shoulds, all of the things that you're supposed to do. And I don't know about you, but I was really bad um, in school once I got away from my the my the pressure and that the things that you have to do. Like right. you have to go to school when your parents take you to school. And, you know, but when you get to college, it's a little different. And, you know, I was I was very young um, emotionally. At that age, I was um, one of the youngest in my class. So that's not something really people think about developmentally and, and maybe a little bit more these days, but it's a new concept of emotional intelligence and understanding personalities and understanding who am I. Yep. You know, at, we're just like, you go to school, you get good grades, you get a good, the, you know, you do the things and the stuff and you're going to be happy. You know. Yep. You're going to you're going to you spit out the information they give you on a test and yeah, you graduate and you get married and you have children and boom, what else do you want? And that's it. And then, you know, and then when life kind of throws you a curveball or it, that is not, you know, a box that you fit into. Like when I went to college, I was just I was just happy if I could do my laundry and not turn something pink, you know. <laughs> so, and I hated school. 
I hated school and I, I was really, I was really bad. I would, I flunked out my first semester and ended up back home. I, I, I like fought it because that's what my father was like. You've got to get a good job with a pension, you know, and, and both my parents worked for the government. My mom worked for the VA hospital and my dad worked for the state of Missouri. And so there was very much this, you know, the paradigm of, of the framework of how to live your life. And here I am now as like an entrepreneur doing something that is, you know, very avant-garde in in the way that we look at things and absolutely not. But let me I'm ask you a question because I swear my father asked me this question until he passed away and I did two years of college and then broke off. Are you making any money? Oh, right. The, the question is never, are you happy? Um, are, are, is your, are your student loans paid? Um, is your car payment paid? And now let's face it, when, you know, that industrial age mindset was, you know, served back then. But as we even come from the information age to something different and, and times they are a change in, you know, that generational gap. And when you're not raised in, in an entrepreneurial family, like, you know, one of my great, um, my great, I don't want to say idol, but like someone I really admire is a Sarah Blakely and she's the founder of Spanx, right? And mm. one of the questions her father would ask her every day was, how did you fail today? Like, did you take yourself to a point where, you know, you, you stepped outside your comfort zone and embarrassed yourself or did some, you know, that was not how I was raised, you know? And my mother was the same as like the, the, the man makes the living and the woman makes the life worth living. I mean, that whole patriarchal societal norm was, was what I was, I was raised with. Now, you go into college and you're flunking out and, you know, I'm getting arrested and I'm doing all kinds of like stuff that, oops, like, <laughs> oops yeah. And oh, oops again. And, and I finally managed to, you know, like eke out a diploma, but it took me five schools and six years and a lot of pain and suffering and self-medicating and then marrying the wrong man and then getting into the, I was just, you know, I was trying so hard to fit into that societal girdle that we're all, you know, we're all told to. And so it's no wonder when you're put into a box or allowed yourself to put into a box and you don't have the emotional intelligence and you don't have, here's the thing, when you don't have the self-confidence, the awareness of self, and you come from a family that where addiction is, um, you have a propensity for it. Mm. it becomes very easy to fall into that because it fills a need. Mm -hmm. It fills a need and allows you to feel a certain way. What was, what was the addiction in your family? Uh, it, well, when it comes to my father it, work, you know, he oh. was, uh, you know, kind of an anything a holic, like, you know, kind of go big or go home, but he was very much about it, it which is great. But when you're um, a sensitive and feminine and emotional that learning the word discipline in my house had a very different meaning than it does, than it could have. And so discipline was a bad thing. Mm. And uh, my, my brothers, you know, I had two older brothers and, and, you know, the family dynamic is so critical. And, and let's, let's, Let's face it, you guys, if you're listening to this, then you, then, and you're going, yeah, you know what? I, I can relate. I had a dad that who here has a father that's like really hard working guy, you know, and, but it, it doesn't translate to you because you don't, it, it, all it feels like to you is abuse. All it feels like to you is anger. All it feels like to you is control. And that's what happened with uh, my oldest brother conformed, my middle brother rebelled, and I fell somewhere in the middle where I was just con freaking fused. So um, when I woke up to a message, and this is kind of maybe leaping forward from my childhood, but um, like I said, I got into a marriage that wasn't super awesome. So, you know, when you're trying to do what you should, you kind of just let you know, you're, you're like the fish, you just go where the flow goes. So I woke up to a message about my ex-husband and he, you know, at the time he wasn't my ex-husband. Mm. Um, and it was from a strange woman on Facebook, like who here wakes up and the first thing they do, you grab your phone. You know, most of us grab our phones and we start to scroll and to get that little number, 
you know, you, you click on the message and you check it. And it was from this woman. It said, um, no, he, he was, he wasn't cheating. That would have been easy. <laughs> he said, um, you might want to talk to your husband. I see you're doing all of this traveling. You're, you know, doing Tony Robbins events and all of this stuff. You might want to talk to your husband about where he's getting the money to pay for it. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. And that was a tough pill to swallow. And um, at, at that moment, my life as I knew it was over. You know, all of the things that I was used to and the life that I was living and, you know, I was doing all of the shoulds. I got the degree, barely. I got married. I stayed with him for longer than I should have. Ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> in a relationship longer than they should have been. And I was just miserable. And when I got that message, yeah, it was probably. Did you know what she was talking about? Paying for it? Uh, yes. Did you know? No. Oh, That's okay. a good question because you, you know, because a lot of people, I got criticized a lot for a, a long time by a lot of people. They'd be like, "How could you not know? You were married. You lived with him. You know, how could you not know?" Well, it's not like you ask. You know, ever you know. So did you rip good anybody morning, up today? Yeah, good morning, sweetie. Did you have a hooker last night? Yeah, exactly. You just you know that's just not the way. But um, so. I, I knew something was up. It just, it never kind of felt right to me. What was, because I'm like, he doesn't, I really, I never saw him on the, I just, something felt off, mm. but I couldn't put my finger on it. And I was like kind of too scared to ask, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's like, um, ignorance is bliss sort of thing. But um, I, when I approached and I confronted him about it, it all fell into place. And she, she actually said, you know, if you question the validity of this, call his friend. You know, it, and it was his best friend's company. And there was like, and and the details of what actually happened, you know, that's not necessarily, like, that doesn't matter. But what matters is that everything about all of the things that I had been shooting doing and the life I've been trying to conform to was making me completely miserable. It wasn't who I was. And all I was trying to do was just get through the days. And and now it's blown up. Uh, yeah. And and um, first it had to blow up and then it had to build up so it could blow up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and what I mean by that is that it had to like explode, you know, everything had to fall apart and then I had to go pick up the pieces. And did you guys have kids? No, thank goodness. Oh, okay. No, okay. No children. So, so that was I was going to say, so what happened with him? Um, well, I mean, he, you don't have to give me details. It's his yeah, story, no, yeah. he actually, I, I, you know, he did go and pay his dues to society and in his own way. And but he went to jail, right? Yeah, he went to jail and he was indicted and it and um, all of that sort of things. I mean, you know, you he, he he wasn't on the scale of like Bernie Madoff, but he was a financial advisor and he was doing stuff he shouldn't be doing. And I see. and um, and I I can't I I kind of. I don't want to say feel sorry for him because this isn't about him. This is really about, you know, the 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 story of of how you can look at something that will take you make you feel a certain way, like you know, alcohol or drugs or whatever. It fills a need, guys. Yeah. And if you're not a, a person who has dealt with addiction or is dealing with it or been really closely related to it. Because it is, it is um, in a familial, you know, my because it was my brother that inspired the work that I do now, and um, oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, I remember I read that that he died of an overdose, right? Yes, and I and you know I did a TED talk about it um, not too long ago, and my father hasn't won't you know won't even watch it, doesn't even probably know that I've done it because they're in such denial over 
the fact that there is any kind of mental illness or any kind of addiction. And there's so much, you know, shame is like a fungus, you know, yeah. it, when you put it in the dark and you close it down and you hide it and you keep your skeletons in those closets, it breeds. Yep. Yep. And when it's I, it's a good analogy it, and it's very true. It is so true. But when you can shed the light on it and be vulnerable and, you know, like people, the great inspirational individuals like uh, Brene Brown, who's like openly talks about it, you know, and says, look, this is something I dealt with yeah. and I still deal with. And and that's the thing. It's like, and I would tell my mom and she'd be like, well, honey, why don't just pour the wine down the sink? And I'm like, why do I have wine in the first place? Yeah, so. it it is such, uh, you know, we talk about this on the podcast a lot, but it's just, it's such a misconception for a lot of people who don't have an issue with addiction in that they don't understand why you can't just stop, why yes. you can't just have one glass of wine and walk away from it. Right. And, and I say this because what people don't understand is whether it's alcohol or marijuana or, you know, heroin or, you know, uh, benzos, like, whatever, yep. some people can take them and stop and maybe you can't. And do you want to yeah. play that game and try and, and see and, what and happens? You know, it's interesting too, because everybody has their favorite flavor of suffering. Yep. And most of us are, are addicted to our problems. Most of us have like, we, first thing we do, what's the first thing we do when, when we wake up? We think about the shit we got it. Can I say that? Can we, yeah. we think about the <laughs> stuff? Can we think about the things that we're supposed to do today? You know, what do I got to do? I got to take care of the kids. I got to do this, got to do that, got to do that. And it's the, all of the things that are coming from a space of lack. And yeah. so what, what really hit me, um, cause all of these things happened at once. Like I, I woke up to the message about my husband and then now I, all of a sudden I'm almost 40 years old and I'm homeless and I'm waiting tables. And then my brother passes away and he was a, and, and you guys, you want to talk about opening a can of worms. You know, he was a former Naval officer, but he wasn't considered one of the 22, which is kind of a BS statistic because there's so much out there that does, you know, that doesn't get recorded. Um, because they said his death was called by caused by angina. So it wasn't, but it was fentanyl. Ah, you are listening to the addiction podcast point of no return for more information on the podcast or to reach out. If you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at the addiction podcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. So they- and what you know, year was this? This was 2013. Yeah. It was two days before Christmas. And and the story is really powerful at, because um, I had just gone to- a Tony Robbins event where he had done an intervention with me one-on-one -on -one in front of thousands of people. Here I am at this event. I have like $300 to my name. I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. And I'm standing there. My hand is shaking, holding the microphone while this six foot seven man like, like rips me open and says, <laughs> do you see, you know, talk about shedding some light on some things. And after that experience, I, literally took my last few hundred dollars and said, I, I, I got to go home, you know? So I booked a flight and, um, I was going to surprise my family. I said, I, I, you know, I need to be around family. I need to be around, you know, people just, just love. I need to go home. And the night before I was to leave, I was actually packing and my mom called, which was kind of odd because, um, I hadn't spoken to my parents in months since this whole thing with the divorce and, you know, and the whole thing that really, they were really mad at me about is that I kept my horse. Oh, and no. this is where, you know, you ever read it, you ever get to the part of the murder mystery novel where you're like, oh, I think I did get it. <laughs> this is the piece that it was the, the, the keystone for where, what the turning point in my life was. And it was the decision to keep my horse. Hmm. And I still, like, I still get really emotional about it Yeah, because it was the one thing 
that didn't judge me. It was the yeah. one place I could go and I could have been, you know, crying about my brother or just gotten fired from my job or which also happened. You know, <laughs> it's just like it didn't matter what was going on in my world. I could be around this animal this that doesn't speak English, yeah. that doesn't have a clue, that just understood me mm -hmm. and judge me and just accepted me, which is, come on, guys, that's part of the reason why we indulge in our negative behaviors in the first place, because we just want to, can I just, when do I get to fall apart and not be judged? Why do exactly. I always have to be the one that has my act together, right? Yeah. Who here would like to be able to just fall apart for a minute and, and like be okay, not being okay. You know, and that's yeah. what was happening with yeah. my horse. So did you take your horse home? Cause you were going to go home, right? Yeah, no, parents? I went home to just visit. So oh. I was packing to go home for Christmas. It was two, the night, two nights before Christmas, December 23rd, 2013. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm like nervous about going home. I hadn't told, like I told one person. So when the phone rang and I saw it was my mom, I was like, that's weird. Why is she? And I'm like, dang it. So-and-so must have told her that I was coming home. I was the only reason I could think of that she would be calling me. Yep. So I picked up the phone, you know, like, hey, mom, you know, who kind of who, who let the cat out of the bag kind of. <laughs> and she said, your brother's dead. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> I'm so sorry. And, yeah, I, I was. And he was active military at the time. No, he he was retired military. Oh, he's retired. Okay. He was he he was um um a technician, a medical technician, and he was an X ray tech. And then he went and came, you know after he he left the military, went and became a nurse, and now he was a nurse in the ER. And we all knew that he was struggling and was having trouble with different you know with alcohol and and you know walking a fine line. And and when you're a nurse, you've ever seen that um there's a, you know Nurse Jackie. You know, it was that, it was like that show. Every time I watched that show, I was like, that's my brother. Yep. We had so, a nurse on the podcast that had a drug, uh, had, was addicted. Yeah. While and she so was a nurse like, and while she was working. Um, yeah. It was, yeah. And it's like, you can only hide it for so long, you know, because the addiction overrides everything else. Yep. And, um, you know, not uh, that it matters, um, Jen, but when you say that he overdosed, was it an overdose or was it something mixed with fentanyl? which I don't know, the more we talk about fentanyl on the podcast, it's almost more of a poisoning. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what they, they said that was in his system. And, and again, the details of, of every aspect of it were sort of clouded by, you know, the way my family tried to keep things under wraps. And, you know, I'm the only one talking about this in my family and my right. family doesn't talk to me because I'm talking about this. Right. You know, it. so, and um, his daughter, his 21 year old daughter found him, you know, laying in a pool of his own blood. And, you know, that was just in the bathroom. And that was just one of those things. And, and fentanyl is so crazy because the dosing, you know, because you know, the dosing is so all over yeah. the map. That's what I mean. That's why I say, you know, like you can, you can die from like too much heroin, but if you take like what, what I would, a normal dose of heroin, not that there is such a thing, but <laughs> yeah, that but has fentanyl in it, it can kill you the same right. way. And, you know, um, it's the same anyway. thing, you know, with the, with the opioid overdose. Yeah. 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 Like that, yeah. You know, when, that when you back off and then you get back in, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, it, and it's any, it, it's the same with anything. It's like yeah. anyone that that's, Okay, you guys, if you're listening and you're like, I really wish I could put that, I could stop drinking, and you stop drinking for a period of time and you go back to it, you go back to it the same way you did before, when you quit. Yeah. Yep. And you're like, whoa. You don't start with one sip right. like you did right. when you started. Yep. So yeah, and that's the progression of it that that's so challenging to deal with over time. Right. You know. So how did so tell us about the program that you do and kind of how you got started on that? I mean, we know yeah. now your relationship with your horse. What was your horse's name? His name was Trace, like Trace. number three okay. in Spanish, because he okay. was his mother's third baby. So okay. that made sense. So I hung on to him. And um, again, you know, my when my mom called and said, you know, she said, is there there's any way you can get home? I was already packing. It was like something guided me to 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 be with the family. And that's what happened with my programs too. It was just there was something that was guiding me. And 
when Jeff died, I was like, I knew that there were people out there besides me that could benefit by being around, being around horses. And, you know, it, it's so tough because they're like, oh yeah, I went horseback riding in Jamaica once, or yeah, well, I rode, rode a pony as a kid. We've all had sort of, or, oh, better yet, I've seen the Budweiser Clydesdales for the Super Bowl, you know? So the, like, what do you think of when you think of a horse? You know, we were talking about like Steve even said he thinks of secretariat and yeah. we all have, because if you think about it, our civilizations were built on the backs of these animals. Yep. They fought our wars. They carried our families. They plowed our fields. They fed us. You know, they gave us milk, the, the, the military, mobility, meat, and milk. Like the four M's of the of of what the and what the Rockefellers, you know, built. They don't call them iron horses for nothing. You right. know, right. So they, but now it's like only one out of every nine people have direct access to a horse. Yep. So like ninety one percent of the population. I mean, like, I don't have access. If I wanted to go see a horse, I don't even know where I'd go. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, right. you drive down the highway and maybe see one out in a field somewhere, right? Yeah. And so, and I've done some work with um, like some inner city kids and and people that don't have access and PTSD veterans. And so we've had a lot of those interactions and they're like, wow, I had no idea they were so big. And, you know, I had no idea. Like there's so much like awe around it. But the problem is, and I know that everybody that has um, experienced the coronavirus or been around it globally, we now know there is a, a, a direct connection between our mental health, our physical health and nature because mm -hmm. we are part of nature and horses are nature in its finest form. Yep. They are the ultimate prey animal as we are the apex predator. And when you can connect with the horse, and this is why I say horses and not dogs or dolphins or cats or whatever, because dogs, dolphins, and cats are all predators. Hmm. And predators have the eyes on the fronts of their heads. Because even if you look at dolphins, they look this way, right? And so if you think about it, horses are prey animals. And while dogs are looking for preys, horses are looking for proof. Because they need you to prove to them that you're not going to eat them. Yeah. And when you are suffering from a trauma or a hurt or addiction or lack of self-worth, lack of self-confidence, fear, uh, I'm not enough and I will never be loved. There's something about these animals that when you go out there, they will, they will seek you out to heal you. Yep. And they can ground you in a way that no other animal on the planet can. I, I think I think that's amazing. And I even though I have not personally experienced I experienced it, I completely believe every word you're saying. Yeah. Well, and you see it, and there's more yeah. and more science behind it now too. Yeah. Like uh, you know, between the coherence between our heart rhythms and our brain waves, mm -hmm. um, the theta brain wave state that the horses live in. There's a, a really, uh, the cleverly titled book by a doctor, and he says, uh, zebras don't get ulcers. <laughs> they, you know, it they says can, it right they, there. Right. They know the difference between when, when the lion is hungry and when he is not, right? And they understand how to tap into that fight flight instinct. And when to be in coherence. But us as human beings, we don't do that. Yeah. We live in sort of high beta all the time, driven by the mainstream media, social media, social pressures, our parents, our beliefs, all the things that we should do. Yeah. I was there for years. And so getting that message from that woman, although it totally dis destroyed the world as I knew it, it was almost like it was a relief. Yeah. I can see that. So your program, where is it and what and what do you do in the program and how does it work? I mean, you kind of told how it works, but. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, it's just I what I say. I call it PFM, pure freaking magic. There you go. Because it really just is. And it's very hard to explain, like you said, what it is. Um, but I'm in West Palm Beach, Florida. That's where I'm based. Oh, okay. okay. And so I'm not too far from, from where you guys are, but no. in South Florida. And then, but I do travel. Okay. And I have, um, so think about if you've ever done like a, have you ever, have you ever done like a personality profile? Yes. Like, you know, Myers-Briggs or one yeah. of those 
quizzes, right? And I have a quiz. You can go to my website and take a, take my quiz okay. and, and see what that's about and connect with me. And we can have a conversation and discover the number one question that every great thought leader leads with. Miguel Ruiz in his book, The Three Questions, Oprah Winfrey, Deepak Chopra, all of them, Eckhart Tolle, Michael Singer, Stephen Covey, Brene Brown, I could go on and on. The number one question that you need to ask yourself is who am I? Mm. Who am I? And quizzes and all those are, are great. But when you go inside and you can connect with that person, you're the authentic you, the true you, the, the you that is not coming from the survival mind and listen to the whispers of the universe and the answer they don't call me a horse whisperer because I whisper to the horses. Right. They call me that because I listen to the whisper of the horse because they will tell you who you are. Interesting. So I have four different horses. Trace is one of them. I have Dante, who is kind of my bold, like I call him my 1200 pound Tony Robbins. <laughs> and then I have Maverick, who is sort of my introvert and sort of reserved, but sort of, you know, kind of like the quiet knight in the background protecting everyone, but also very observant. And then I have Bella, who's kind of like you and I, like mm. never met a stranger, has a huge Rolodex and knows everybody. And <laughs> what do you say, like, hi, hi, what do you do for a living? Oh, I got it. <laughs> she just went so, you know, that social butterfly. But it has a hard time focusing. That's us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. And when you go out and you just, you just visualize like being out in this beautiful field with these animals and feeling just their energy flow into you. And one of these horses will resonate with you. And it's not necessarily the horse that you like or the horse that you're like. It's, it's the one that one, likes you. It's the one that, yeah. yeah. Right. But it's really the one um, that has a download. It has a message or a gift to give to you. Yeah. And it it changes. I have a woman that comes to my um, has come to my retreat year after year, and a different horse chooses her because she's in a different place in her life. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Before you go any further, what's your website, Jen? What's oh, the website? Uh, oh, the website you can go and find me at zenergen.com. Z e n e r j like Jen e n dot com. Z e zenergen dot com. Z e n e r j e n dot Okay. That's that's my Facebook and my YouTube. I have a lot of really great YouTube videos out there that dive a little deeper into this. And I have a virtual programs where I you can come and, and taste test this and see, oh, what is I want to see Bella or I want to see Maverick or what does she mean by a horse can tell you what you know. I have some virtual programs that you can do for, I have people from all over the world experience that. And then if you're if you want to come and visit me in West Palm Beach, then I have on-site experiences um available as well. And then so, you do retreats, you said. Yeah, workshops. I do day workshops, retreats. I do a lot of corporate team building because understanding inner you know, understanding who you are allows you to understand who others are and how to adapt. The big piece is how can I adapt who I am to fit the situation and be appropriate without changing who I am. Right. And staying right. true to yourself. It's a, it's an important point. Yes. Very and important most, point. Most I think you need to be I, more like others. I was just going to say, sorry, we keep talking. I'm sorry. That's the, the liability of zoom and cell phones. I think that your program is, it just sounds like a wonderful program for people. And I think it's definitely something that would help people in recovery. Um, you know, we've talked a lot of, on the podcast about how addiction doesn't only affect the addict, it also affects everyone around them. And this sounds like this would also be a good program for those who have a loved one who's suffering from addiction. A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. I think it's huge. So leave our listeners with one final positive message they can take away. Oh, I love it. Take the time it takes. Give yourself the gift of self-discovery and believe in yourself. It will change your life. Perfect. 
Thank you so much for listening. I think that the program that Jen has is amazing. And I know that she is helping people and will continue to help people. And it's something that you probably want to check out. So check her out. Zener Jen, Z-E-N-E-R-J-E-N dot com and also on social media and check out her beautiful horses. We have a beautiful photo of her with her horses, but whatever you do, get help. Don't wait. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back again with another interview. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.